thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you today. It's a real pleasure um, to be able to share some of my experiences in this space. Um, you'll apologise if I'm slightly slower than usual. It's 10 p.m. here um, in Brisbane, so it's been a long day. Uh, but I'm looking forward to speaking with you about this topic, and I hope it will be engaging for you and that you'll have lots of questions. Do please feel free to add questions into the chat as we go, and we'll have plenty of time to address them at the end. I want to talk to you today really about some of the lessons that we've learned from working on a number of very large scale um, native fire health information exchange engagements around the world. Um, I trust that some of these learnings will be interesting. Um, and effectively, I want to just do three things. Obviously, I'll introduce myself just a little bit more and tell you about some of the things I've done in the past. Um, but we want to just take a bit of a detour and talk to you about um, what's been happening in Australia for the last 10 to 15 years, because I actually think it's relevant to this conversation. Um, the reason why we here in Australia are on the cusp of moving in a very similar direction and, and um, about to choose a native fire health information exchange solution here is on the basis of what we have learned from the current system that we have. So I want to spend some time just making sure you understand um, what we've done in Australia, share some of the lessons that we've learned and how those lessons are driving us towards this more modern architectural approach of using fire at the core of everything that we do um, at incredibly large scale. I want to talk secondly, I guess, about the direction of travel with regard to modern health information exchanges around the world. And I'll share a couple of examples from Canada and from the US where this has been done at significant scale um, and has the potential to scale um, to almost any level, we believe. And then I want to just share some of the lessons that we've learned in engaging in those large scale projects. So what are some of the key architectural lessons that we've learned that I think you can potentially take away and save some of the time that we've had to spend learning those lessons? I really hope today that is a gift to you in terms of being able to reflect on some of those things without having to experience some of the pain that we've been through in order to have to learn those lessons. Um, so Char already introduced me. Um, I have a um, 20 year background in health informatics. Um, I've been a chief information officer of a hospital system here in Australia. So Tasmania is one of our smaller states, um, but ran a network of hospitals and all of the IT operations and strategy components um, of that. Um, I've been a founding member of our Australian Sparked Fire Accelerator, and I'll talk a little bit about what that is and where that fits into the picture um, of health information exchange. Have also been actively involved in um, health informatics and standards, both at the Australian level and also at the international level, and um, have written former um, national digital health strategies or been a co-author of those here in Australia, so have had involvement on the national stage as well. So as we get started in today's presentation, I want to talk to you about some of these lessons that we've learned here in Australia. In order to do that, I probably need to start by just explaining to you what is the system that we have in place in Australia. We have essentially today um, a system called the My Health Record, which is a national shared health record. Um, originally, it was called the PCEHR, the Personally Controlled Electronic Health Record. Um, was renamed a number of years ago to, uh, to My Health Record. But that system went live in 2012. So it's something that we've had here in Australia for a long time. Um, currently, 24 million of the 26 million Australians have a record. Um, initially, the system, when it was launched in 2012, was an opt-in model. So people had to choose to sign up. Um, in 2019, we had a national opt-out process meaning that after a significant period of communication, um, Australians were told that unless they objected, they would be getting a record. Um, and about 3% of Australians, I think, opted out. Um, many have since opted back in. But as you see, we now have most of our population signed up to this shared health record. Um, it has come at a huge cost, and there is still quite a lot of controversy about whether it has delivered any significant value um, but we have spent over two billion Australian dollars on this system, which is a lot of money, and um, that debate will continue to rage on. 
Um, but we are now at the point where we know that we need to modernize this system and I'll explain why and what some of the challenges are with it and what's pushing us towards a native fire HIE solution. Again, just so we're clear what this system is, it is a customized CDA document repository. It's based on Oracle technology that is now close to end of life. It's hosted in the Azure cloud and currently holds about 1.3 billion CDA documents. So a significant number. Some of those are automatically generated kind of administrative documents. So it's probably not quite as impressive as it sounds, but there are a significant number of clinically curated documents um, I'll show you what those look like in a second, or at least where they come from. So, for example, we have shared health summaries that are curated by general practitioners. And a shared health summary is effectively like an international patient summary. It's an aggregation of um, information about conditions, allergies, medications, some of the basic things that you would want to see about a patient coming out of primary care. Um, and many of the medicine related documents are actually automatically generated and that number probably makes it sound more impressive than it is. Some of those come through our prescription exchanges, which are now largely electronic. And there are um, a reasonable number of consumer curated documents as well. Um, one of our challenges in Australia is that we use a specific version, an Australian specific version of the CDA standard, not the CCDA that's used in America. And that means that from a health informatics perspective and from a standards perspective, we are somewhat um, backed into a corner. And again, this is driving us towards a more open standard in, in FHIR, where there's a much broader community of skills that can help us with the health informatics work that we need to do. Um, originally, the health, um, the, the My Health Record, the shared health record was intended to be a distributed system of conformant repositories. Um, so it was going to use, for those of you that have heard of this, the IHE XDSB standard um, and to be a network of conformant repositories. The reality is that because of cost and complexity and timeframes, that didn't happen. So the My Health Record is a centralized document store. They're all stored in one place. Originally, that was an on-premise solution that has, in the last couple of years, been moved into the cloud, as I said, and hosted in Azure. And I guess the challenge we have today, and this is an enduring challenge of these systems, is it's perceived to be of relatively low value to clinicians. And we have um, somewhat reluctant usage in our clinical community, um, but I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. This is a diagram that came from the original concept of operations for what was then the personally controlled electronic health record. The idea was in the middle to have these conformant repositories. Effectively, they could have been regional or domain specific sources of information feeding into a national system. However, as I said, that didn't happen. But as I talk more about a new architecture for health information exchange here in Australia, we'll see that that idea has um, come back again and we're exploring whether regional and domain specific um, repositories of information, effectively sub HIEs will be an appropriate architecture for us and exactly how that would work. Um, the system takes uh, today takes a number of different CDA document types. So I mentioned shared health summaries as being somewhat akin to the international patient summary. We also have discharge summaries from hospitals, um, which are fairly self-explanatory. They're produced upon, upon discharge. And um, we have pathology results, radiology reports, um, event summaries are a much more generic um, structure that can be used for information coming out of specialists or allied health um, or even aged care. And then we have some information that tends to be automatically generated and come out of other government systems. That includes organ donation information, um, immunization and childhood immunization information, and some of your information about um, rebates for prescriptions um, through the government. Uh, Medicare system that we have here in Australia. So that's a little bit about how the My Health Record works today. I guess in reflecting upon this and building a national HIE, um, whatever technologies we use to do that, I wanted to point out some things that I think we've done really well here in Australia, because whatever technology you choose to build an HIE on, you're still going to need to ensure that this layer is in place. 
Um, I'm fortunate enough to actually be quite good friends with Graham Greve, who is the primary author of The Fire Standard. And some of you may have heard Graham speak before. He's a lovely guy and very thought provoking. Graham uses this phrase national treasure. Um, and I really like that phrase. We have, if you like, here in Australia, built us some national treasure on a few different fronts. And these things, I think we couldn't be having the conversations we're having now without having these things in place. One of those is legislation. We have actually built some quite strong legislative frameworks, particularly around privacy, around consent, around the use of identifiers and the mandating of identifiers in different contexts. That legislative layer, although it's not technical, um, does lay a lot of the foundation work for what we've been able to do in the way that we've been able to share data across the country. And I'm happy to explore any of these aspects as we go. I will talk about some more technical aspects later, but I think it's just really important to lay these foundations um, as, as we build up to talking about HIEs with FIRE. We've also built a very strong healthcare identifier service um, that is capable of allocating identifiers to not only individual health consumers, patients, but also to health providers and to organisations. Again, this has been a critical piece of infrastructure in the ability to match patients and ensure that they don't have duplicate um, identifiers is a harder problem than it appears on the surface and one that we have done relatively well at. And in order to do anything in an HIE, you really need a layer of identification um, that works well. So again, this is a truly underpinning service, as is what we call our National Clinical Terminology Service, um, the NCTS. So this is a group that used to be part of our digital health agency, has now moved across to the CSIRO, um, one of our Commonwealth scientific organisations that leads a lot of research in e-health. And they are responsible for authoring the Australian version of SNOMED. So it's a clinical terminology and ontology um, that many of you, I'm sure, would be familiar with. We take the international version, we Australianise it, and then it's published on a regular cycle, so typically on a monthly basis, um, as is the adjunct to SNOMED. So effectively, it's a, an additional reference set for SNOMED, the Australian Medicines Terminology, which describes um, all of the medications that we use in Australia in a standardised way. So those two pieces of clinical terminology, again, are absolutely fundamental um, to the work that we do because it has allowed us to drive a degree of standardization. They are not mandated as standards here in Australia, but they have become de facto standards and software vendors have generally speaking adopted those technologies for a number of different reasons because it's given them competitive advantage in their product. And last and not least, I think um, just the sheer number of connected software providers that we have, you can imagine over the course of the 12 years of operation of the My Health Record, we've been able to connect a large portion of our ecosystem into this network. As we transition to a more fire native health information exchange, we have to be careful to evolve that gently um, and not break those conformance processes and to um, take advantage of what we have today. We've also done some interesting things much more recently in the last 12 to 18 months that have been of great value. Um, I know that Alvin would have um, been up to speed and some of you may have heard the CSIRO speak on these things. Um, the Sparked Fire Accelerator has been a government funded initiative to expedite the creation of standards in Australia. Um, ironically, although we are home to the person who invented fire, um, Australia has been very bad at implementing fire over the last 10 years. Um, it's only in the last 12 to 18 months that government has really taken this seriously and funded a process to produce standards. Um, that process is going really well, and we have a line of sight to standards that government now um, has a plan to mandate into um, the software community. So legislation is forthcoming in Australia that will ensure that these standards are actually used by software vendors. Um, surrounding that is a, a strong governance structure and process, which is just standing up. Um, and in addition to the healthcare identifiers that I talked about before, we have a health provider directory, um, which is also another foundational piece of infrastructure. So being able to locate um, healthcare providers in terms of their physical 
and electronic endpoints to know how to communicate with them is a major part of being able to distribute information to the people who need it. Um, it sounds like a simple problem, but it's a really key thing that we've had to solve. And this is probably our 10th attempt at solving it. Um, it has been quite hard. Um, and again, lastly, we've built in recent times a very strong developer community in the fire space. So I think we've learned that it's not enough to just have software that is fire conformant, but we need a marketplace of people who are fire skilled because if we are to reap the benefits of standards, we need a market full of people who can help us if we need them um, with it, the implementation and maintenance of standards and software that use those standards. So government has invested in training, free training for many developers to upskill them in fire. And I personally have been involved in that process of educating people on um, how to become fire developers. That's certainly something worthy of consideration. So this is some of the national treasure that we've built in Australia, but there have been some massive challenges. And these are providing some of the push factors towards a more modern architecture. These are some of the reasons why we want to move away from the way that we're doing things today. And if we had the chance to start over, we would almost certainly do it in a fire native way. Um, to start this conversation, I want to acknowledge that one of the major learnings through the work I've done is that sharing health data is not just a technical problem. It is a socio-technical problem, and we really need to consider some of the broader factors of engagement and incentivization and really bringing the clinical community along in that journey, the change management component of that. We have not done that very well traditionally, and I think we've learned a lot of lessons. Before I come to that part of the conversation, though, um, we have a burning platform from a technology point of view. Not only have we spent $2 billion on getting to where we are today, the operation of the current system that we have costs somewhere between, and these are my guess figures, they're not exact, this is not a quote from our government, um, but somewhere in the region of 100 to 130 million Australian dollars per year. That's a huge cost. Um, the architecture that underpins that my health record is a monolithic architecture, which is very hard for anybody else to operate other than the people who built it. And therefore the cost of operating it, it can only be done by one vendor at this point. Um, and it's become prohibitively expensive. So these are some of the push factors that are leading us to want to do this differently. We want to get away from a monolithic architecture where we can't replace pieces of that architecture. It's either all or nothing. And we have a big um, heart transplant ahead of us, if you like, to replace that technology over the coming few years. Much of that technology is end of life. And also we found that using the CDA document standard um, whilst documents have a really good place in, in the standards world, it does constrain many of the future use cases. So the inability to capture data in a granular, um, structured, fine-grained way means that it is hard to reuse that data. And if we can't reuse that data, that stops us from doing some of the things that we want to do. Fire will give us a much more fine-grained access to data that can then be reused um, subject to clinical safety in a variety of different clinical use cases. We haven't been good at defining those clinical use cases. So I think, again, one of the pieces of advice I would offer those of you building HIEs for the first time is to be very clear clinically why you are doing these things, because often the architecture that you build is going to be relative to the clinical use cases. Architecturally, often there is no right or wrong answer other than what is the clinical use case that we're trying to solve and architecting to support those clinical use cases. We can talk a little bit more about that in the chat potentially. Um, and I think we've also been quite poor traditionally at clinical engagement and change management. We haven't brought um, healthcare providers along on the journey with us. A major part of the problem here has also been the clinical data quality. If you're going to aggregate data into some central point, you need to have some sense of how good that data is and how much work you're going to need to do uh, to deduplicate it, to make sense of it. Um, is it going to be incoherent? Um, we have some unique challenges here in Australia, so I can't speak for all of the nations that all of you represent, 
Uh, but here in Australia, people are free to visit in, in primary care, are free to visit whichever general practitioner they want to visit. Therefore, potentially, patients have records spread across two, five, ten or more general practices, all of whom store their uh, medical records separately. So therefore, the act of aggregating a patient's data back into the centre can be really um, quite complicated. Um, in terms of incentives for clinical participation, they have not always been well designed. So if I'll give you an example. I went into a general practice clinic recently where they have 20 general practitioners. And the way that they get their government incentives paid, government pays them to upload a certain number of shared health summaries per month, depending on how large their patient population is. Um, in that general practice, one of the practitioners is responsible for uploading shared health summaries for all of his patients so that the other 19 general practitioners don't have to use the system. You can see that that incentive design doesn't achieve the behaviours that we want. What we want is the perception of value in the system so there is pervasive use across all of the clinical community. What we've ended up with is what is the least that we need to do in order to get paid so we don't have to touch the system. That speaks to a system that doesn't have high clinical value or clinical utility. So I wanted to share these things because I think they're all really difficult socio-technical things and we can talk as much as we like about technology and we will come to that. Um, but if we don't think about these things, then these systems can easily be a failure. So you've heard me talk about some of the um, the push factors away from the current architecture that we have in Australia. But if we look around the world um, and look into the United States and Canada as well, there is a growing consensus that FHIR offers us a great standards-based way on which to build modern health um, information exchanges. <clears throat> Obviously, we're trying to get away from the monolithic architectures that we have today and the, the vendor lock-in and the cost implications that that has and move towards a more open standards-based system that has a community of people around it that will drive down the cost because we can potentially replace components of that system as they need to be replaced not replace the entire thing every time it needs to um, be updated um, but i think an important thing to note and this is something that many people i've dealt with have stumbled on is that they assume that in order to use a native fire hie all of the feeds into that system have to already speak fire. And that just isn't true. In some of the better fire servers today, they offer extensive capabilities to, um, I have to be careful here because there's no such thing as automatic mapping, but they offer frameworks that speed up the ability to map existing data into a fire form. So even if you are in a country where you have no fire today coming from source systems, coming from primary care, coming from hospitals. You can still potentially make use of a native fire HIE by doing mapping at the ingress and egress points into that HIE server. You can use some of those frameworks. And these are some of the things we're thinking about and building here in Australia at the moment. Essentially, how do we translate all of our existing CDA content into fire format? Um, and do that in an automatic fashion so that we don't have to regenerate that content in some other way. Um, so not every contributing system has to be fire capable in order to derive the value that I'm going to talk about over the next few minutes. We've talked about the push factors. These are some of the pull factors towards doing a fire native health information exchange. And really once you have your data in that fire format all kinds of really exciting things become possible and look i'm only going to touch the surface of this and maybe we can explore this more um, in the question time i'm absolutely fascinated by the event driven capabilities we have through fire subscriptions and notifications the ability to even at an individual patient level to notify people when certain healthcare events occur and use the hie there's a point um, of which, from which to drive that. There are so many exciting use cases that that could help us with. So for example, a patient presents in hospital, 
And there may be a whole care team that needs to know about that in real time. Imagine if we could notify that care team in real time that their patient had arrived unexpectedly in hospital and, and the things that that could do for our health system would be really quite fantastic. Um, at a more technical level, just the ability to automatically validate fire as part of the fire server capabilities makes the conformance testing process so much easier. So you can imagine a major part of um, bringing on board new connections to a health information exchange is making sure the contributing systems um, speak in the right formats and, and are valid. Um, therefore, being able to somewhat automate that process versus the very manual processes that that has been in the past significantly will speed up the process of bringing more connections into the HIE. And that's not something that should be overlooked. I'm really excited about the potential for clinical decision support, and I'll talk more about that in a second on the next slide. Um, and also in conjunction with, with clinical decision support, Smart on Fire, and the ability to have ecosystems of potentially third-party applications that meet specific needs. Um, and it's probably not the right time for me to introduce Smart on Fire. I'm trusting that you have some understanding of what that is. Uh, but the ability to deliver some of those clinical decision support capabilities back into existing um, electronic health records, electronic medical records, and, and at the point of care um, is just hugely exciting because the speed of deployment of some of the capabilities we need in the health system will be sped up so much. I think also one of the most exciting elements is the way that we can start to do population health work. So one um, it's not part of the fire standard, but it's an adjunct to the fire standard is clinical query language or CQL, uh, which offers huge, exciting potential for the world of analytics and for asking clinical questions of the data that we have. Obviously, we wouldn't do that on top of an operational data store. We'd have a separate analytic data store. Um, and also we, we potentially have the other adjunct standards like SQL on fire and OMOP. Um, but once we have data in this fire standard, all kinds of things become possible. And very quickly, I just want to draw you a picture of um, where I think we're ultimately heading and one of the really key reasons we're doing this. If you think about what it looks like to be a learning health system, really ultimately what we're trying to do in the health system is to have the guidelines that we set for our clinicians telling us how we should generally practice, obviously there'll be exceptions, but how we should practice comes from research and public health surveillance. That should be providing a major input and, and justifying and providing the evidence for um, clinical practice guidelines. Those guidelines in an ideal world, and we don't live in this ideal world today, should then be translatable into operational clinical decision support so where appropriate, those guidelines should actually interact with clinicians within software systems and make intelligent, helpful recommendations. And yes, I want to acknowledge the challenges of alert fatigue and the poor design of clinical decision support in many of today's EMR systems. But in an ideal system, we would have genuinely helpful clinical decision support that is derived from the clinical practice guidelines that we define potentially in computable form. And then what we would love to do is actually be able to measure what happens in clinical care and make sure that what we said should happen in the guidelines and we try to make happen in the clinical decision support actually happens in the measurement and the quality measures that we wrap around. And then ultimately we wanna be able to very quickly turn that quality measurement into reporting of what happened so that we can complete this cycle and refine and become a learning health system. The problem today is that every single step of this learning health system, clinical quality improvement life cycle is utterly disjoint from every other step. So in Australia, the group that does every one of these pieces is completely separate and does not largely talk to the groups that do the other stages. By using FHIR as a standard and using FHIR native HIEs, we finally have the ability, we have a platform on which we can begin to bring this life cycle to life and begin to define computable clinical practice guidelines which can be expressed in CQL and automatically turned into clinical decision support in systems 
And then automatically we can make sure that we are measuring the same things that we said we wanted to do to see whether they actually happened. And we can really, as I said, bring this cycle to life. That is the vision. It's a multi-year vision, but that's really where we're going. If you want to put it another way, the outcomes that we want from doing this work are not technical outcomes. We want to drive towards clinical outcomes and improved health system that can do this in real time. So let's talk a little bit more technically. Um, I just want to kind of show you some of the, at a very high level, some of the ways that we're thinking about this in Australia. Um, we are moving towards, we are rapidly moving towards a native fire health information exchange, which has a range of services, um, fire validation and conformance, support for arbitrary implementation guides, and our Sparked process is working on those Australian core standards. We have something called the AU core, um, which is parallel to the US core, which will be the foundational implementation guide to support the work that we're doing. Um, also, it will have a series of services for discovery and record location. There is a model here potentially where we will go and get things directly from hospital systems and general practice in some cases. Um, we are still thinking about firstly, what are the clinical use cases? So therefore, what is the right way to do this architecturally? Um, so in some cases, there may be a direct connect to hospitals or general practice or aged care. In other instances, and I think this is likely to be the more common model, we're probably going to have regional HIEs. What that means is, you know, in, in our states, as we call them in other countries, they would be provinces or regions. We will have a state sub HIE, which will be responsible for aggregating all of the information across that state. And then the, the national HIE will talk to that state HIE as needed. And in some instances, it will um, store the information at the center. In other, in other cases, it will get the information as it needs it. It really does depend on the use case. So we will potentially have a lot of these regional sub HIEs. Um, we may also have what you could call domain-specific um, HIEs. So we may have some HIEs that store pathology and radiology information. We may have some that are specific to primary care because of the unique structure we have of primary care um, in Australia. But you get the idea. There are a range of different kind of sub-HIE approaches that we could use here. Um, also in Australia, we have this particularly unique problem um, that we have to migrate off an aging technology stack, which is high cost, and migrate 1.3 billion CDA documents into fire formats. We are working very hard at the um, at productizing something that will do this process very efficiently and very quickly, um, because that's a key part of our legacy that we have to deal with. So this is what we're thinking about in Australia, but these kind of patterns are common to all of the places that have already done this. In Australia, we're thinking about this. In the US and Canada, this has been done on a large scale in a number of places, and I've been fortunate enough to work with those places. Um, as we consider doing that, there are a range of products that are, in theory, capable of doing this, and I've listed some of them here. Um, given the time, I'm not going to go into much detail. Um, but effectively, the, the ones here are really the, the credible fire servers that are being considered in Australia. Um, but I have to say, and I have to put my cards on the table, having done some work with Smile, because it, for me, is just far and away the most capable um, fire server. It is the only one that has really scaled to a significant level. Um, we have not chosen a fire server product yet in Australia, but I think Smile has a very good chance. Um, just to give you an indication of some of the projects that I've participated in um, that Smile has also been involved in. Um, one of those projects in the US has 14 million patients, has sent cumulatively um, over eight and a half billion messages to this point, um, involves 140 hospitals and a thousand other clinical facilities. So to give you a, an idea of the scale that that technology is being deployed at, in a Canadian example, there are 15.5 million citizens, over 200 hospitals, 4,300 pharmacies, 40 billion transactions a day, one terabyte of data generated per week. This is the kind of scale on which we are deploying fire servers as native HIEs right now. Um, and in proof of concept, it's been shown 
at this stage and, and I think it would certainly scale further but um, we've done tests that take transactions up to 255,000 transactions per second using a fire server meaning that it is quite possible to scale this to a national level um, and and that has very much been proven through the work that we've done. Um, so finally, I'm just conscious of time, so we have plenty of time for questions. I wanted to quickly just talk about some of the architectural lessons we've learned from these kind of projects that I've been talking about. Um, this might sound controversial, but actually my belief is staying cloud neutral is ultimately a good thing commercially, um, because one of the challenges we faced is actually the um, yes, some of the cloud providers do offer differentiating features, but if you use them too much, then the problem is you can't switch cloud providers and you want to be able to switch cloud providers so you can keep the pricing contestable because when you're talking about the amount of compute power that you might need for a national solution, um, you have to constantly be being competitive about this. Um, I think getting the database design right is absolutely critical. And again, this is a topic we could go into in a lot more detail, but using something like MongoDB for unstructured data and Postgres for structured data is a really good starting point for designing databases. Um, the work that I've done with Smile, and this is exclusive to Smile, um, they have a, a capability called Megascale because um, although to you, a um, hundred terabytes of data might seem like a lot, um, the reality is, you know, today that's a large hospital EHR. Um, in the future, a hundred terabytes won't be that much, but a hundred terabytes is often the limit of most relational databases. And a lot of cloud host hosted databases won't even get to that kind of level. Therefore, you need a capability that allows you to um, scale the amount of storage that sits without having to have tens of different fire servers that you then have to somehow aggregate the data between. Um, Smile has the ability to do um, aggregation and have it present a single fire server whilst having multiple databases in the back end. Um, it's an incredible capability and they call it mega scale. Um, also a variety of techniques to improve performance. So sharding, um, which can be part of that mega scale or it can be done in other ways. Caching to improve um, to reduce the load of on databases, improve performance. And I think horizontal scaling, again, is incredibly important because not only do you want to scale up, but potentially you want to scale down. And if you don't know exactly how much compute power you're going to need, um, you don't want to over provision because commercially that can become um, very painful. Um, we've also found really early performance testing is critical. The general rule of thumb here is that fire queries should have a latency of, of approximately under 300 milliseconds um, is a good rule of thumb. Um, we found some people have a tendency to try and rely on open source software. Obviously, it's, it's great to have open source communities, um, but don't try and have open source software power your HIE. It's really important to have the support that comes with a commercial version. Um, we've also seen it incredible value by using tools like the CSIRO Onto server as an external um, way of managing clinical terminology. We can talk more about that if people have questions. And last and certainly not least, you have to build a community around fire. You know, we don't just need a standards-based solution. We need a standards-based community with vibrant, um, you know, architectural development vendor contributions. Um, and only then does really fire start to take off and give the value that it can. So conscious that I've um, probably spoken enough. Thank you for listening to me. And I hope that's been interesting um, and very happy now to just take some questions. Um, so not sure how we want to do that, but um, yeah, let's go to questions. Thank you, Sir Tim. For the first question, we have one from Dr. Alvin. How effective is the electronic uh, prescription system and is it available nationwide? Yeah, so we've been doing electronic prescriptions for a long time now. Effectively, all of our prescriptions are electronic um, or are sent through an electronic script exchange. Um, also, now we have an electronic um, consumer component to that. So consumers can be sent a barcode um, in order to 
um, give them access to the scripts that they have. So yeah, we've we've gone a long way down the path of electronic scripts. That's something we've done quite well. That's part of um, our national infrastructure, but it sits alongside um, the My Health Record. It's it's a an adjunct system. It's not actually part of the My Health Record itself. Yeah, thank you, Sir Tim. Our next question is from Mr. Anis Fuad from Indonesia. So what are the incentives to the citizens for using My Health Record so that achieved 24 million records of Australian population using it? Yeah, look, I mean, there was effectively there was a national debate around this. So there was a marketing campaign that tried to sell the value of this to consumers. Um, so there's no commercial incentives. Um, but the value is um, supposedly that, you know, if you present in a different clinical context, then um, those clinicians will know something about you. Um, whether that's true is a matter of debate, um, but obviously a lot of Australians have seen the value in that because, you know, as you can see, 24 million records for a country of 26 million people is quite significant. So I think we've done something right there. Yes, uh, Dr. Alvin also has a question um, related to that. So what incentives do you give doctors to use electronic systems? Yeah, it differs by um, which sector you're talking about. Um, so in hospitals, there is no incentive. Um, and, and that can be problematic. What we tend to see is that work involving um, discharge summaries and any kind of clinical system is often delegated to the most junior doctor in the room. Um, and there's probably a longer conversation there about the fact that people perceive those tasks as being administrative rather than clinical. And, and I disagree with that. I think high quality clinical documentation is actually part of being a good clinician and part of quality and safety. It's part of continuity of care. Um, but nevertheless, in, in hospitals, you know, it's done by junior doctors, generally speaking. In primary care, we do incentivize doctors. So I mentioned the payment that general practice receives. We have these things called practice incentive payments. So it's not the doctors themselves, it's the it's the practices that they work as part of get a an annual payment based on whether they meet certain targets. So they have to upload shared health summaries for a certain proportion of their patient base. If they do that, then their practice gets a payment, which can be shared with them. Um, so those are the two major groups. This could be a lot longer conversation, but those are the two major major incentive groups. Yes, uh, thank you, Sir Tim. Um, for the next one, we have four questions from um, Dr. Nico Azhari Hidayat from Indonesia. Um, maybe you could uh, briefly share about telemedicine in Australia. Um, specifically how it's performed the proportion of telemedicine providers from the government in the private sector, and then the cost mechanism for services and the digital health education in universities. Yeah, I mean, there's so many parts to this question. Um, telemedicine is funded to a degree through our Medicare system. Um, so doctors can claim billing items for doing telehealth um, with, with patients. However, when we say telehealth, most telehealth, in fact, 98% of telehealth in Australia is actually done via telephone, not video conference. Um, there is a recognition at government level that actually, in some cases, um, video is probably better than telephone. And there's a move to try and get people to use the right channel for the right context. Um, but there are a lot of questions here about digital literacy amongst patients and also digital literacy amongst healthcare providers. And some of the technologies we have have not given clinicians a great user experience. It's been too hard and it's made it very hard um, to adopt. And therefore, um, depending on, on what you see as successful telemedicine, um, you know, we have some telemedicine, but it's, it's mostly telephone. Um, it's covered under Medicare, um, there is good education happening in medical schools about the role of these technologies, um, but the older generation of doctors is not convinced about using them. Yes, uh, thank you, Sir Tim. Um, our next question is also from Dr. Alvin. So how do we estimate the technology resources 
such as cloud, database, storage, um, network, etc., needed for a country of 110 million people? Um, yeah, I mean, again, these are hard problems, but they're not unsolvable. We have um, a lot of data from the kinds of projects that I've talked about. So we have a reasonably good understanding of what that infrastructure would look like. Um, but it, th there are other variables we would need to factor in. So depending on how many source systems um, that we have and what kind of messages they would be sending, we need to kind of do some work to understand over time what the profile of that load looks like. Um, but there are models that that do exist now that could do an estimation of that. But when you combine it with a scale up, scale down model using Kubernetes and containerized deployment of um, fire server components, you can actually take a lot of the risk out of this because you don't necessarily need to size that infrastructure correctly on day one. You know, you can scale it up and down very quickly based on changing um changing profile of workload so whilst when we used to do this stuff on premise this was really really risky um, in the cloud this is much less risky than it used to be now i'm simplifying something that's not simple um, but it's not as hard as this problem is not as hard as it used to be Uh, thank you, Sir Tim. Our next question is from Irina Roy from Canada. Um, which fire server product are you using in Australia to serve as a back end? Yeah, so um, the national government program has not chosen a product, but they are about to start that process. So we're only a few weeks away from um, a procurement process that will start to make those decisions. I suspect that procurement process may take a year or more. Um, but the sort of vendors that I listed on on that list are the kinds of people who are the most likely to to potentially pitch for that kind of work. Uh, thanks, Sir Tim. Our next question is from Dr. Benji Hussein uh, Pangayibat from the Philippines. So developing national uh, health data repository that is fire-based is a very complex endeavor. What basic groundwork do you suggest in order for the development to progress um, efficiently? And how important is HTB? Yeah, I'm not quite sure what you mean by the acronym HTB. Um, maybe Dr. Benji can I put it in the chat. Um, but but Benji, you're you're right that um <laughs> it is a complex endeavor. Um, one of the things I tried to lay out was I think there's some groundwork around legislation, around policy healthcare identifiers, terminology, those things really do need to be in place to a degree if you are going to be successful in an HIE endeavor. Um, absolutely, we have learned that through experience. Um, but it'd be good to understand what you meant by HTB. I think it's not yet in the chat, but maybe we can get back to it later, um, yeah. Tim. And then uh, our next question is from Dr. Aminul Islam from Bangladesh. Uh, we have two questions, actually. So the first one is, what level of digital readiness requ is required to implement modern HIE in the national level? And then what type of technological challenges um, a country may face in order to implement modern HIE in the national level? Yeah, again, those are really good questions, and, and they would probably take a lot longer than I have to answer them well. Um, I don't believe there's any kind of formal model that assesses that, but obviously to if you have no history in your country of HIE, to go straight to an HIE um, is potentially ambitious. Um, if I were looking to do this, I would certainly be looking to maybe prototype it regionally um, before necessarily stepping up to doing it nationally because I think there are potentially some in-country lessons that you need to learn. Um, again, I would say if you don't have a lot of the pieces that we just talked about, so legislation, identifiers, um, you know, policy around consent and those kind of things, um, terminology, if you don't have any of those pieces, you are not ready to do an HIE. Um, it will not be successful. You cannot um, safely identify patients without some formal approach to identifiers and that typically requires legislation or at least policy and regulation um, 
so so yeah I would, i'd say that kind of functions in a way as a as a maturity model or indigenous digital readiness model um and and you know remember what i said in terms of question two there remember what i said about this is a socio-technical problem and you have to take the change component of this very seriously the change component of a program like this is far harder than the technical component and bringing clinicians and ultimately patients on this journey um, is a major part of this. Uh, thank you, uh, Sir Tim. Uh, Dr. Binji has already replied, so HBT is healthcare transaction based. Yeah, yeah. So that's the Oracle product that we use today. Um, look, it's effectively end of life. Oracle might disagree with that, but from our perspective, it's effectively end of life. Oracle obviously have a strategy to replace that with additional product that comes through their Cerna acquisition, um, which I think will be considered, but I don't consider that HIE solution to be a modern HIE fire-based solution at this point. Um, that may change. Um, Oracle is very good at spinning a story that tells you they have something when it's often not quite ready. Um, that's for you to think about, but that's been my experience of working with Oracle. But look, I think in Australia, we're looking to move away from HTB. Yes, uh, thank you, Sir Tim. Um, actually, we only have uh, one minute left, but I hope we can still entertain our last two questions. I hope that's okay. Sure. So this question is from Dr. Jose Dumagay. Thank you for the presentation. Very interested in the migration from CDA to FIRE. Any tools that you're looking into for this job? Are you building custom tools? Any chance that uh, those tools can be generalized to apply to unstructured clinical text? Yeah, look, that's a really interesting question when I have to think about. Um, I'd say what we're building at the moment is more of a framework that maybe will become a product or reusable tool over time, um, but it's relatively early stage. The problem is, you know, to claim that something will just magically work in any situation is very difficult. You are going to ultimately need a software framework to help you with this, because if you have CDA in your country, it's going to look probably a bit different to our CDA. Um, if you're using C CDA, then some vendors have some quite good out of the box tools. But again, they will only take you 90% of the way there. You'll still need to do some um, some custom work. So I'm happy to have an offline conversation about that some more. Um, can they apply to unstructured clinical text? I, get, I guess it depends. Like if that's part of a CDA document, then yes, there is a way to extract that. Um, it depends a bit on what you mean by the question, but I hope that helps a bit. Yes, uh, thank you, Sir Tim. So our last question is from Dr. Azrin Subir from Malaysia, who is managing and maintaining AU Core in Australia. And how does AU get consensus on localization? Yeah, great question. So that happens through our Sparked Wire Accelerator. That's funded by government, um, but is a um, collaboration between the CSIRO, which is a government organization, the Australian Digital Health Organization, which is the peak body for um, digital health in Australia, HL7 Australia, which is the local branch of the HL7 Standards Organization, and then the broader fire community of vendors and health informaticians and clinicians. Now we have a lot of clinicians involved in this process. Um, so we have meetings on a weekly basis. We have done for the last 18 months. Um, and we are now at, you know, voting on version one of AU Core. We'll have version two. Um, by the time that we put it into production. So it's been an incredible process. The, the power of what you can do through community is really exciting. Thank you, Sir Tim. And that was our last question for tonight's session. Before we close the session, I think uh, we can ask our um, governing committee for some words before we officially close. Uh, maybe Dr. Alvin or Dr. Bunchai, if there's anything you'd like to say. Tim, thank you very much uh, for the time and uh, the practical wisdom. Not many have access to the knowledge that you have, so I really, really appreciate you sharing uh, your experience. Um, I, I think the, the, a lot of countries are now convinced that they all need a, a repository. They now agree fire is in the picture. Some have subscribed to Snowmed. 
but these are just building blocks you know like you have a big box of lego blocks and they're still not put together so i think the countries in the call right now are really uh, looking for how do we put the lego blocks together so that it actually serves the function of a clinical data repository so thank you tim dr bujai Uh, so, so uh, sorry, thank you, Tim. Uh, but uh, I, I'm driving, so uh, at uh, we uh, it really enlight enlightened to know to to learn about the Australian <clears throat> experience. I really like your uh, uh, presentation. Uh, we record this and we will distribute to our communities. Uh, can 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 you share your presentation to our communities? Sure, that's fine. Okay, thank you. Uh, and, thank you. Uh, thank you. Bye. Thank you. I'll see you tomorrow, Tim. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.